Welcome to tonight's event, Kafka's Place After the Tel Aviv Trial. I am Terry Gordon, Director of Jewish Cultural Studies at the New School for Public Engagement. We are here today to listen to and take part in a discussion between two Kafka specialists concerning the proper place of Kafka's manuscripts. It is a pleasure to introduce our speakers, Mark Anderson on the floor and Mark Elver. Mark Anderson is professor of German and comparative literature at Columbia University. He is the author of Kafka's Clothes and is currently editing The Metamorphosis for the Norton Classic series. Mark Gelber is professor of comparative and German Jewish literature and director of the Center for Austrian and German Studies at Ben Gurion University in Israel. He has written on a wide range of German Jewish and Austrian Jewish writers, including Heine, Broad, Canetti, and Kafka. The conversation tonight will be moderated by Vivian Liska, who is senior professor of German literature and director of the Institute of Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. So we have an international group, uh, all originally based in New York. Uh, Vivian Liska is currently a visiting faculty member at New York University. She's giving a three-week course on, on Kafka. Uh, Professor Liska is the author of numerous books, among them When Kafka Says We. This event has received support from various departments across the university. To this end, I would like to thank Laura Frost, Chair of Liberal Studies at the New School for Social Research, Inessa Medzibovskaya, Chair of Literary Studies at Eugene Lang College, Val Vinicor, Director of Jewish Studies at Lang College, and Carolyn Berman, Julia Folks, and Ricardo Montes, Co-Chairs of Liberal Arts at the New School for Public Engagement. Finally, I'm grateful to Pamela Tillis, Director of Public Programs at the New School, for helping to make this event possible. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the conversation. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for organizing this and for introducing us. Um, I will try to moderate this conversation uh, less by uh, introducing the facts themselves because I realize that as soon as one starts telling the facts, one already takes a position. And as a moderator here, this is not my role. Uh, so instead, I would like to introduce uh, some issues that are at stake in this conversation. Um, what is at stake in thinking about Kafka's place and the place of Kafka's manuscripts? What I would like to do is structure this with questions uh, and a dialogue between our two speakers in terms of uh, three topics. And I took these topics from the description, the announcement uh, of this evening, uh, where it says that we will be discussing here uh, the fate of Franz Kafka's letters and manuscript that have become a matter of literary and national importance. So the first topic and uh, the crucial one to start with is the relationship between the literary and the national. Uh, this question uh, has a long history and tradition. Uh, this relationship between the literary and the national was very different in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, and again today. Um, what role does literature play in the uh, self-definition, in the identity uh, of a nation? Uh, we know, for example, that in 19th century Germany, uh, literature was an intrinsic part of uh, the German nation and its self-image. Uh, uh, this was dissipated at certain moments in the early 20th century and w became again uh, an issue in the post-colonial context where individual groups would, uh, and, and nations would again insist on, uh, you know, re recovering and making visible their uh, literary patrimonium. So the first question will be uh, the relationship between the literary and the national in this context. The second issue uh, 
uh, that uh, we will uh, discuss will uh, be the question of the value of manuscripts in a time, or to quote Walter Benjamin, in the era of and now infinite technical reproducibility. What uh, value do manuscripts have uh, when they can be infinitely uh, reproduced online and uh, be made accessible? So there is something to manuscripts uh, that remains. What is it that remains beyond their sheer you know, make readability? Um, that will be a second issue. And uh, the third, uh, and maybe the most delicate one, because it has been uh, discussed in very controversial ways, uh, is the one of belonging. Uh, who, you know, in, or in, to quote the title uh, of an article by Judith Butler in relation to this issue, uh, who owns Kafka? Uh, where does Kafka belong? Uh, who does he belong to? Um, this will be the, the last point that will probably bring uh, the rest together. Now, uh, just to uh, thought to, to start, I was wondering about the issue of place in Kafka, uh, in Kafka's own writings, and what came to my mind was the story, uh, Die Sorge des Hausvaters, literally the worry of the Hausfather, the Pater Familias. Uh, it's a story that uh, features a strange creature, an elusive creature, and the Hausfather tries to capture, to grasp, uh, and to con in some ways to control this creature, uh, but fails to do that. And uh, he wants to have his name, he wants to have, and at, at some point he asks, uh, where, where do you live? Where is your place? And uh, this creature, it's half spool and half human being, uh, not quite clear, replies, um, kein fester Wohnort, no fixed abode. So what we are reflecting upon this, evening is the question of the Wohnort, the appropriate Wohnort uh, of Kafka's place and the place for his manuscripts. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, start uh, asking uh, Mark Anderson to lay out some of the facts and okay. uh, we'll start from there. And that will lead us, I imagine, to this first issue, uh, the relationship between the literary and the national. Yeah. Yes. OK, very briefly, because it is a, a long and somewhat convoluted, complex history. <clears throat> and Mark, if I uh, miss something or make a mistake, please chime in. The question of the uh, really starts with Kafka's controversial uh, wish, his last testament, to a asking Max Brod to burn his manuscripts. So the question of, you know, who owns them, whether they should exist at all or not, um, was uh, put into, uh, into question mark by uh, this wish of Kafka's, and Brod famously uh, ignored that wish, uh, stating that Kafka, he had told Kafka that he would never do that, uh, Kafka should have appointed someone else to be his literary executor. In any case, Kafka died in 1924. Uh, Max Brod stayed in Prague until the Nazis marched in in March of 1939. Uh, he left right before that with the Kafka manuscripts in his suitcase, and he went to Palestine. Uh, in 1947, he gave the manuscripts, the manuscripts, not the rights, but the manuscripts by Kafka that belonged to him to his secretary, a woman named Ilse Esterhofer, uh, who uh, was helping him edit Kafka's work. Uh, and Brod had very little money. My understanding is that uh, the Czech he was a citizen of, of Prague, but uh, there was no pension uh, for his long years of work in uh, uh, what was then the uh, Habsburg Empire or later the Czech uh, Republic. Um, uh, Brod uh, didn't have money, and as a way of paying, 
the secretary, making sure that she would have money uh, if and when he died, um, he gave her the manuscripts. In 1947, there's a, uh, there's a dated uh, Shenkong uh, in which he formally gives uh, his secretary these manuscripts, his own but as, as well as the ones that he owned by Kafka. Um, he, he wrote a last will and testament uh, in 1961 or 62, again reiterating the same thing, that he was giving these documents to her, um, and he died in 1968. Uh, at that point, when the will, the question of probate arose, and um, the property of Max Brod was going into the hands of Izes de Hoffa, um, the Israeli government challenged uh, this uh, will, uh, and there was a court trial, and I believe in 1974, an Israeli court decided that Max Brod had wanted to give the manuscripts to uh, his secretary and that she did indeed own them. So the manuscript stayed in her possession. Uh, she lived to be, I believe, 101. Uh, in 2006, uh, I think she died. Um, and before doing that, she gave, she didn't, um, couldn't make up her mind exactly what to do with all of the manuscripts. She sold a few here and there. Notably, the trial in 1988 was sold at auction in London uh, for three and a half million marks, uh, about a million pounds. Um, but uh, still, there were a number of manuscripts in her possession, some of them in uh, bank safes in Switzerland, some in, uh, in Tel Aviv, and some in a family apartment. Uh, at her death, she had given, uh, also in a last will and testament, the manuscripts to her two daughters. Um, and again, when the issue of probate came up, the Israeli government and the National Library of Israel challenged uh, this bequest, uh, and there was a trial. And at this, and this time, uh, in October, about a year ago uh, uh, now, uh, in October last year, uh, a decision was reached that, uh, in fact, uh, the daughter of uh, the sole remaining daughter of the secretary of Max Brod no longer did not actually own the manuscripts, had never owned them, just as El Esther Hoffer, in the view of the court, had never owned them. And so uh, that's where we are now. The family has the uh, Ruth uh, Hoffer has, it's Ruth? No, it's Eva. Hoffa has uh, appealed this decision, and we still don't know the final outcome of Kafka's trial. It, uh, it uncannily reproduces the uh, unfinishable quality of trials in Kafka's works. And in fact, even in her judgment, uh, the Tel Aviv judge quotes Kafka at length in the, in the trial. Uh, it's a funny instance of life imitating art. Um, but we're still waiting to find out uh, uh, where the, uh, what will actually become of the manuscripts. To my understanding, they're still in the possession of the uh, daughter of Broad Secretary Esther Hoffer. Um, Mark, do you want to add I just anything? I'd like to add one thing about if, on the facts and just say that already in 1948, um, Broad stipulated quite clearly that um, his secretary and, and lover, Ilse Esther Hoffa, um, would have, uh, she would be his uh, universal erben, as he put it. In other words, she would inherit his papers and, and uh, archive and, and money, et cetera, et cetera. But she was directed by him I think in every instance, I don't think there's one instance, and that was in 48, 57, 61, and then in other material that's come to light since that time, in every instance, she was directed to deposit this material in an appropriate archive or library, and Max Brode named those libraries. The court, when, it, uh, when this came to trial you know, just recently, that is, uh, decided to view the will of 1961 as the, as the uh, definitive last will of Max Brode. And there he used the famous formulation, which was something like, I give this material, this material, the word that he used was Verfügungsrecht in German. In other words, she had the right of 
depart, she had the right to deposit it, but she should deposit it either in the library, the Hebrew University Library in Jerusalem, or the Tel Aviv City Library, or another library in Israel or abroad. You have this, this formulation, this or, or, or formulation, which gave four options, of course, is worthy of, of some serious consideration. And Wybrode formulated it in that particular way. But nevertheless, it was clear from the start that um, this material was placed at her disposal in order to eventually deposited it in an appropriate archive or library. And at the same time, Broad made it quite clear, in, uh, in, that is in, in the, certainly in the document in, in, the, in 1957, that Max Broad's daughters were not capable. In other words, were she to, he assumed that she would outlive him, which certainly happened. He died in 1968. So, she outlived him, and she said, but he said, you will outlive me, but make sure your daughters will not have anything to do with this decision. That is because they don't really understand who I am or what I have accomplished. And it, rather, it should be somebody who does understand what Prague, I, I will add this, he doesn't say this, what my career was about, what Prague Jewry was about, what Kafka represented, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go into that in another detail. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. It was not only a, a, a kind of a gift with no strings attached. It was certainly uh, a kind of a gift because the word shenkong, I think, is used by mm -hmm. Broad there. But nevertheless, he was, he was clear that it should be either the Hebrew University Library, or the Tel Aviv City Library, or another library or archive in Israel, or abroad. And um, the judge and the court case, a lot of the court case was f focused on that particular formulation, and the, there was an attempt to try to determine to what extent all of those, that ser those series of possible options were equal, that Bro didn't really care. Or did he prefer one of them? By placing the Hebrew University Library first, which is it, w w the name of that library in 1961 was the Jewish National and University Library. So the Jewish National and University Library, which he calls the Hebrew, the Hebrew University Library, or the library in Jerusalem, the university library in Jerusalem, depending on which document you look at, uh, because he named it first, the judge wanted to know, did that mean he preferred that institution rather than Tel Aviv, another library in, in Israel or mm -hmm. abroad? Yeah, no, I'm looking, uh, I have a copy of uh, a translation of uh, Broad's will, and it's the famous uh, paragraph 11. Uh, and let me read the appropriate part. He said, Broad is talking about the manuscripts, letters that have been written to me. So my manuscripts, letters, for, in, for instance, by Kafka written to me, and the rest of my literary and musical estate. Okay, I bequeath as follows. Uh, and he says, this part of my estate shall pass to Mrs. Ilse Esterhofer, however she will have to see to it, that after her death, the rights and financial benefits, such as author's fees, will reach her beneficiaries. So it's clear that he wanted her and her children to not to starve, to, to have the financial benefits of this possession. And then uh, these documents shall be delivered for safekeeping to the library of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, or to the municipal library in Tel Aviv, or to any other public archive in Israel, or abroad, uh, to the extent that they are not yet in one or a few of the aforementioned institutions, or in the event that Mrs. Hoffa has not made any other arrangement during her lifetime. Mrs. Hoffa will determine, Mrs., and this is the last line of this clause, Mrs. Hoffa will determine which of the aforementioned institutions is to be selected and the terms of the safekeeping. Now, uh, 
whatever Max Brod wanted uh, for these manuscripts to be done with these manuscripts, he had given away his right to uh, determine that when he gave her the manuscripts. Uh, and Mrs. Hoffa, for 30 years, was in negotiations with the library of university, uh, of, of Hebrew University, um, and to my understanding, never reached an agreement with them. Um, she had her chance and didn't do it. Um, so it's, uh, from my point of view, a somewhat uh, questionable uh, legal decision now suddenly to say that, uh, especially after an Israeli court had recognized uh, that she did in fact own those manuscripts um, and presumably paid taxes on the royalties, the benefits that she had over the period of time uh, that she owned those, uh, suddenly in 2012 to, to say, uh, to take that back, so. Yeah. Um, can I uh, yeah, jump in. ask you, yes, um, uh, thanks for explaining the facts and replying, uh, giving us the exact quote. Um, what do you think is responsible? You said it's a strange decision. What do you think is behind this decision? Well, the strange, I, I'm not a legal expert and uh, I've read the decision. Uh, w the strange, complicated, uh, uh, legal situation is that Max Brot was trained as a lawyer in Prague uh, in the, 19, in the uh, early 20th century under Habsburg uh, law. Um, he had an understanding of the law and wrote his first gift bequest uh, to his secretary in 1947 before Israel existed. Um, so Israeli law didn't even exist at that point. Um, one of the strange things in the recent decision is that the judge goes back to the Ottoman law of before Israel uh, was created and um, states that a gift, in order to be a gift, it's not enough for a giver to say he's giving it to somebody. The uh, recipient has to take possession of the gift. Uh, and according to uh, the judge in this case, um, Ilse Esterhofer never fully took possession of the gift because Max Brot was still busy editing, making decisions, and so forth. And so basically she said uh, uh, it's Ottoman law, not Israeli law, that is, uh, uh, is applicable. And even though Max Brot wanted to give this to his secretary, um, she, the gift was never completed. Um, Again, I, I have a different take on it, if, it, if I could just express okay. it. My take on that is that the judge, uh, Talia Kupferman Pardo is her name, was actually quite courageous, made a very courageous decision in this, in this particular case, which is sometimes necessary. Um, as, I also am not a legal expert. I mean, I don't, that's not my, my area of expertise, uh, but, for, but also I have discussed this with some lawyers and um, legal experts, and maybe some of you out there can, you know, chime in on this one. But um, you know, sometimes uh, the evidence in a particular case can go in either direction. But that's what seemed to me to be the case here. Now, there wasn't a clear cut when you look at that will and and all the other documentation. Also, some of the witnesses have to realize one of the star witnesses for the. Um, National Library of Israel was Margot Cohn. Margot Cohn was Martin Buber's personal secretary for the last eight years of his life. And when he died, she established the Martin Buber archive in the Jewish National Library. So uh, her, her Zionist uh, credentials uh, are impeccable. She was smuggling children out of Nazi Germany. Uh, during the Nazi period, she was multilingual. She came from Alsace-Lorraine and speaks four or five different languages. And um, she came, she testified that Max Brode and his secretary, Ilse Esterhofer, came to the Jewish National Library after Martin Buber died in 1965, but before Max Brode died in 1968, in order to inspect the Buber archive and for Max Brode to discuss with them in Jerusalem 
how the Max Brode archive would also be established at the National Library. And she quoted verbatim from that discussion. She, after she retired in 1987, I believe, she continues to work until today. I mean, she has an amazing personality. She quoted verbatim the discussion for the judge between Max Brode, the director of the National Library, whose name was Mordechai Nadav at that particular time, and herself. She showed Brode Kafka's letters to Buber, Brode's own letters to Buber, how accessible they were in the National Library. And uh, she quoted Brode to the effect that, you know, it, would be one, it will be wonderful when the friends from Prague come together again in the National Library, meaning, of course, Kafka, Brod, Hugo Bergman, and Felix Welch, whose archives, that is, these are the, this core of, of Prague writers, intellectuals, uh, writers, intellectuals, schoolmates. And, and schoolmates, I would also say either Zionists or very close to Zionism at the same time, uh, that they would come together again in Jerusalem. So she quoted as a very powerful statement uh, and uh, also used the term, by the way, übergeben instead of verkaufen. In other words, that Max Brode's intention was certainly to bestow, to bequeath this material to the National Library and never to sell it, that this was not characteristic of the generation to which Max Brode belonged, that is, to sell an archive. El Isla, you say, how come? Ilsa Esterhofer also belonged to that generation, and she was very willing to sell it. But for um, this particular group who had, who had either contributed to the Zionist project and those who had escaped Nazism and come to Palestine and were instrumental in creating or directing Zionist and then Israeli institutions in Palestine and then in Israel. That is, this was, this was what one did. One, one gave their archives, letters, materials to the National Library. And it was something I think that made quite an impression on the judge. I, by the way, I never heard that there was a fight. You know, Max Broad was gainfully employed. That it, what you said at the beginning, I had never heard this before, so I, I'd like to look into it in more detail. Max Broad was one, as soon as he came to Tel Aviv in 1939, he was employed by Habima, that is the, he was the dramaturg of Habima, and he also was active in journalism, and he was paid, that is, I thought he had a, listen, all the salaries were not so great, but nevertheless, he was gainfully employed, uh -huh. and he could feed, uh, you know, himself and, um, and his, maybe his friend as well, you know, it's hard to say. Um, you said something very important there at the beginning. You said uh, the evidence can be understood this way or that way. And then, uh, in a second step, uh, you uh, explained your position and emphasized those aspects uh, of this evidence that uh, support the decision of the judge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The fact that you do this in two steps uh, allows for, uh, or at least, uh, you know, strengthens the uh, the controversial aspect of this. That you are very, uh, that you are aware that one constructs a story, uh, and that behind that story there is indeed uh, there are motivations uh, for the story. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I think we're we're at this question of uh, the relationship between the literary and the national. Um, because <clears throat> uh, Mark Elber spoke very eloquently about uh, 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 certainly a, a strong sentiment in Brod's life was his belief in the Zionist cause. His uh, Zionism saved his life, literally. He devoted all of his energies after he moved there uh, to the Zionist cause. Uh, and it's certain that he would have welcomed that sense of bringing the Prague group together in the National Library. Um, but. Uh, on the one hand, but uh, Kafka uh, was not a Zionist. 
Um, he was interested in Zionism. He thought about going to Zionism. He dreamed of going to Zionism, but he never went to uh, Palestine. Uh, he died in 1924, uh, well before the foundation of Israel. So, uh, and already during Kafka's lifetime, the question of who am I? Am I German? Am I Jewish? Uh, was an issue. Uh, he wrote in a letter to his fiance, uh, Max Brod has just written a review calling me the most Jewish writer uh, of all the, uh, the Prague writers. Um, and Robert Musil, the non-Jewish uh, novelist, uh, has written that uh, this is such a pure crystalline German that he writes, it's pure German. Uh, Kafka says, what, what am I? Uh, uh, I'm a, a, a rider uh, in the circus on two horses, as it were. Um, and he goes on in that, in that vein, but never comes out and says what he thinks. He lets other people talk about him. He doesn't decide. So uh, people have been battling ever s since Kafka started writing and publishing over where he is to be fit. And if we think about the whole problem of the nation, the nation, nation state and a literary corpus that uh, German literature was very conscious of creating itself through its cultural uh, production. Um, somebody like Kafka, who is Jewish, but writes in German, uh, lives in Prague, surrounded by Czech-speaking people, uh, many of them Catholic. Uh, he necessarily complicates uh, this straightforward identification between nation state and literature. Um, add to the mix Yiddish and his interest in Yiddish and his great uh, uh, sympathy for the Yiddish theater, the Yiddish actors, and the way he took part of that repertoire into his work. Um, so one has the example in Kafka of somebody whose work defies those nation, national, easy national uh, categories and this is precisely what is at stake in the trial with, in, in my view, Israel trying to limit Kafka uh, and claim him for Zionism and for Israel when in fact this is one and important but only one part of his identity as a writer. Uh, Kafka, and I'll stop here, there, uh, Kafka said, uh, uh, my blood relatives are and he uses the word blutsverwandten, uh, meaning the writers I am closest to, who I am as a writer, who made me as a writer. He lists Kleist, Grillparzer, Dostoevsky, Flaubert. There's not a Jew among the group. Uh, so uh, it's a complicated question. <clears throat> It's you know I certainly agree with you. This is a very this is a very complicated issue, um, but I, I tend to see it differently. In any case, I tend I, I would just switch. You know, Yiddish. Yes, let's just talk about Hebrew for as, uh, you know with with Yiddish. Because so much attention in the scholarship has been given to Kafka and Yiddish, his interest in the Yiddish theater, certainly. Um, Evelyn Torton Beck's breakthrough book about how the Yiddish theater, uh, his, his uh, fascination with the Yiddish theater, um, led to his own breakthrough by writing Das Urteil in, in 1912, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the, I think, most sophisticated recent scholarship on Kafka has focused now on um, on his interest in Hebrew, on his Hebrew notebooks, and, um, and, and an attempt to understand or find the he Hebraic, if one could say that, the Hebraic element in Kafka's, can we say Germanic, it looks German, I don't know, you know, <laughs> Germanic writing. So uh, the question of, you know, why, why somebody, like Kafka, would begin to study Hebrew, to learn Hebrew intensively. And um, we now have his Hebrew note, several of his Hebrew notebooks. And um, in addition to other testimony uh, from letters and the diaries, and as well, we have some testimony from some of his private Hebrew tutors. Uh, he, he engaged uh, Pua Ben Tovim, who was coming from Palestine, 
1923 to, to teach him modern spoken Hebrew. She later became the principal of a high school in Beersheba. And so some of my own students actually knew her quite well. Uh, so, you know, and she has also written about, you have to realize, what, why was Kafka learning Hebrew? What was that about? He said, well, you know, was he interested in uh, learning exotic languages or something like this? You know, like, of course, you know, he did know Czech and he knew German and he had studied Latin and, and, and French, et cetera, et cetera, in school. But when a, when a highly acculturated Central European Jew in the early 20th century begins to learn Hebrew, then a warning flag has to go up. What's going on? What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry. You know, I think one of the pioneers of uh, looking into Kafka's interest in Hebrew uh, was Robert Alter. Uh, in one of the chapters of his book, Necessary Angels, the chapter is called On Not Knowing Hebrew. And uh, he's discussing uh, Gershom Sholem, who eventually uh, knew more than Hebrew. Uh, and uh, he's also discussing Benjamin and Kafka. Uh, and uh, he's discussing the, uh, the aspect that made them, uh, not only that made them be interested in Hebrew, but also that made them not follow it up all the way. So this again becomes a story that can be read. Uh, you, you know, why didn't, uh, why didn't they learn it all the way? Benjamin and Kafka, why didn't they yeah. go well, through with it? So you could read it in either way. I just, yeah, I think you need to just, before, but. you know, what, I mean, that also connects with what Mark Anderson said earlier about Zionism. You know, Kafka was deeply into his Hebrew studies when he died. So it's really, I don't think you can compare him to, to Benjamin, for example, in that, in that particular context. Mm -hmm. And um, even though Sholem was trying to get a stipend for Benjamin to come to Palestine and, and to learn Hebrew and all of the rest. But I think that one of the important aspects of Zionism, when we say Zionism, you know, and what did Prague Zionism mean, or the term that Scott Spector used and Dmitry Shumsky and Jerusalem, Prague Zionisms, we're talking about different varieties of, of Jewish national expression within the umbrella of Zionism, which existed in Prague at this particular time. And I think it, it makes sense to look at it this way. One aspect of Zionism was attempting to um, discover or uh, reveal one's authentic Jewish self. And the way to do that, according to some voices, was through Hebrew and authentic Jewish language, that one could only do that through Hebrew. And that was seen to be integral to Zionism, this kind of authenticity, Jewish authenticity. Um, Sholem writes about it eloquently to Werner Kraft, for example, and, and to others. But what, what, I'm gonna just come back to this one second and then I'll be quiet, mm -hmm. it's just about, was he a Zionist or not a Zionist, and does it make a difference in this particular case? You know, when I've spoken about the trial um, in Germany and in other places, you know, the, the, I found a, very, a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish issue, which surprises me, among some, by the way, not everybody, but among some. And certainly that was expressed in the press because there were many, mm -hmm. a kind of a culture war was going on between Israel and Germany in the German press and in the Hebrew language press in Israel and maybe other language presses in Israel uh, over the last couple of years. So, um, yeah, I, I think that um, many of, as you say, many of Kafka's circle considered Kafka to be a Zionist whether he did or not. I mean, mm -hmm. let's say, he, if he didn't, certainly Bro did, and Velch did, and Bergman did, et cetera, et cetera. One has, if one looks at Bergman's correspondence with his wife, that is, in 1923, 1924, when she goes back to visit Prague, she, he begs her not to bring Kafka back with her to Jerusalem. 
You know, this is very this is a very interesting kind of thing. I think Kafka certainly is transnational. It's a, it's a transnational phenomenon caught in a legal system that still deals with nationality issues. And as maybe if literature is becoming more <clears throat> more globalized as a, as a as an enterprise in itself, you know, Kafka can fit in nicely in that enterprise. But nevertheless, the courts and the legal systems are still based in particular countries that, that the that the German literature archive was represented at the trial mm -hmm. you know yes. say well was Kafka did he ever consider himself to be German is that was that an issue well th this is um, this is an important aspect of uh, the whole proceedings uh, many scholars were dismayed uh, Kafka scholars were dismayed when it was uh, decided to sell the manuscript to the trial uh, Critical editions were underway. Uh, after Brod's death, there was a desire to create scholarly editions. Um, and unlike, uh, it bears being said that most of the manuscripts are not in, was, were not in the possession of Brod's secretary. Most of the manuscripts went to Oxford. Um, they were given to Oxford by the heirs, by the nieces uh, of Kafka. So that often gets lost. And these uh, critical editions had been done for the castle, for uh, America. But the trial, they couldn't do it because the manuscript wasn't available. Um, and uh, at that, in, in the late 80s, Esterhofer could have sold the manuscript uh, to the uh, library or given it to the library, but I, I think that her finances were an issue. She decided that she would put it up for auction. Um, now, that's, that was a very dangerous move because it could have disappeared into the safe of a uh, you know, an internet billionaire or a, a Japanese banker who just, you know, had a collection of wine and wanted to have a, a Kafka manuscript. And it could have just disappeared forever and never been available for to scholars and so forth. And the, the uh, uh, luckily, um, it was bought at auction at Sotheby's um, by the National Archive in Germany, which has made it available to publishers and some wonderful critical editions. Two different critical editions have come out and have been very important for scholars. Um, but this then raised the issue, um, is it appropriate for someone like Kafka, whose sisters were all killed in the concentration camps, um, to wind up his major, uh, w the manuscript of perhaps his, his, his most important work, uh, in the land of the perpetrators. Uh, uh, I remember when it was bought uh, by the National Archive, um, Philip Roth wrote a letter to the New York Times commenting on the irony of uh, this and lamenting the fact that uh, um, this quintessential Jewish author um, was now being claimed by the Germans. So the German National Archive, which has been making uh, what it has in Kafka and Broad manuscripts available to scholars, is in a very difficult, delicate situation um, uh, in which they do not want to be seen as competing with the Israelis uh, for uh, ownership of the uh, manuscripts. But there has been this, this friction. And they were a party to the trial. and. Um, and, uh, and the Israelis, uh, on their side, have said they don't want Kafka to leave Israel, um, that, uh, that he is part of their national patrimony, uh, and they've claimed him. Um, it, it becomes very clear from both your statements that this is a symbolic issue. Because you do say, on the one hand, that there is, you know, one can make critical editions uh, of these manuscripts if they are uh, made available. But uh, the National Library, as far as I know, uh, wants to make them available. Absolutely. So here we come to the second issue I suggested uh, that we talk about, namely the value of manuscripts uh, if, if, this will, uh, if these manuscripts will be made available. Uh, what difference does it make, uh, you know, if they can be read online? Uh, so, uh, you know, isn't there an aspect of the aura 
Uh, yeah, the, rather the, than the possibility of making yeah. uh, critical the, editions. The aura is alive and well, and it's one of the paradoxes of the internet age that the more we yes. go into uh, the Absolutely. technically reproducible uh, documents, text, MP3 uh, tracks, um, the more fetishized the original becomes. Uh, yes. And uh, Kafka's the the fetishization, the, the interest in the physical manuscript of uh, Kafka has been increased uh, by the fact that he is now digitally available. The manus there's a facsimile edition of his works uh, that has been done in which you can see his actual handwriting on one page and then the uh, typescript of the uh, German on the facing page. Um, and this is... Uh, this has been extremely popular. So far from being less important, it seems to be more important. Uh, uh, as, the, as these texts proliferate, the aura uh, is still there. I would, I would agree. But one of the things that's important is it, was, it seemed to be clear from the beginning of the trial that the material that, was, that, would be, uh, that is not known in the, uh, in the archive of Max Brode um, are, are bro are, it's material from Brode, that is letters to Brode or from Brode, Brode's diaries, which may be the most important unknown document to scholarship. But the Kafka material is basically, was already known. So there, I think symbolic certainly seems to be the right, you know, the right way to, uh, to describe it. Um, yeah. Now, what maybe complicates uh, this issue and that leads us to that third uh, point, namely the question of belonging, and I quoted Judith Butler before, who owns Kafka. Uh, it is complicated by the fact, and you've both done it at some point, uh, this question invites to go back to Kafka and say, you know, what could we deduce, what would Kafka have said about this? And go to his writings and, uh, uh, and no, take evidence from there. Now, uh, I, I want to just give the example of a passage in Judith Butler's uh, essay on, on this question to show how complicated this really is. Um, she uh, very rightly describes and illustrates with strong examples Kafka's uh, writing of non-arrival. You know, Kafka has this mode of writing that, uh, that there will be always another but and a yet, uh, and you never get uh, to, any, you don't arrive anywhere. So it's, it's anti-teleological. Judith Butler uses this to, for her anti, very strongly anti-Zionist uh, claims that Zionism, by definition, understands itself as an arrival, as having arrived. And since Kafka writes in this mode of non-arrival, uh, this necessarily uh, excludes the possibility that he could be reclaimed for Zionist purposes. Now, when I read that, I just from a literary point of view, uh, was wondering whether one wouldn't have to uh, think this through to the end uh, and wonder, well, can Judith Butler arrive at this statement? Um, I just want to use this as a, you know, as a reflection on the complexity of the issue uh, of belonging. Yes. Yeah. You want to know how Judy Butler arrived at her thinking? No, I am saying that Kafka would probably not have arrived at any kind of conclusion whatsoever, because Kafka, if you insist on Kafka's mode of writing of not arriving at a conclusion then you have to think it through to the end and not even come to the conclusion that this should not be used for Zionist purposes because this is a political statement and a strong one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. If we can, um, do we want yes. to, 
Uh, how are we doing for time? No, I think we're at yeah. we're yeah. seven o'clock. We we could we uh, open, open this for discussion. For discussion, yes. Please make sure to take the mic if you have questions. Question. I don't know where the mic is. It's coming around. <laughs> um, okay. She's going to take the mics. Yes. Um, yes, please okay. go ahead. Um, to add an additional wrinkle to the Zionism issue that hasn't come up yet in the discussion. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, Kafka made his first overt statements about wanting to go to Palestine when he met his first love on the very night that he met Felice Bauer. Um, it was the first subject that he brought up, his desire to go to Palestine, and they started fantasizing about going to Palestine. Um, he also fantasized about leaving Prague somehow or other. Um, Felice Bauer lived in Berlin. He fantasized about finally leaving Prague, leaving his parents. Um, getting out of that apartment and being elsewhere. And I think Zionism became a kind of elsewhere-ness. Um, and um, uh, right through to his last love, Dora Diamant, um, they fantasized about uh, going to Palestine and opening a restaurant, and she would be the cook and he would be the waiter. And they did little play acting about this. They even did little shadow games to, um, to uh, act out their <coughs> fantasy of going to uh, Palestine. Needless to say, they never went there, and needless to say, he never married either of these, of these women, although in Felice Bauer's case, he became engaged to her not once but twice. Um, and with Dora Diamant, he was ready pretty much on his deathbed, and uh, the idea that he could even leave his apartment, let alone, uh, he was by this point in Berlin, um, <clears throat> let alone move to Palestine was, um, was uh, you know, kind of uh, not an issue anymore in reality. And I think that his studies of, of Hebrew, uh, which he pursued quite energetically, much more so than Max Brod and others in his group, um, were, were all geared toward that fantasy of leaving, starting a life with uh, first Felice Bauer and then and later Dora Diamant, and, 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 and creating a new identity for himself. And of course, the question of identity that you brought up um, you know, he famously said, um, what do I have in common with Jews? I hardly have anything in common with myself. Um, so I could go on, but I'll, I'll hand over the mic to you. Oh, well, can I respond to that? Sure. You know, it, one of the things that I find interesting about it, I mean, these, these, um, these aspects of the, of the discussion are, are known and have been discussed to, uh, to a certain degree, is that, um, that Kafka was able to use Zionism as a kind of a flirt, as a, a flirt, a maneuver of and flirtation. In other words, it was kind of hip. It was cool to uh, you know to start up with Felice Bauer by saying, "Hey, you know, maybe we take a trip together to to Palestine." You know, and this is you know whether how what, you're right it was <laughs> how fanciful. It, but nevertheless, one should one should uh, you know say, well, you know, it's interesting that it, that it could be done, right? That it could be done, and um, I think, well, you know, about about with Dora Diamon and marriages, you know, this you know these things have have certainly come up before, and there are many different takes on them, um, but. I, I don't know. Um, I was too young to hear Max Brode, but I've seen videos of Max Brode lecturing in Hebrew. His Hebrew was quite good. His Hebrew was really quite good. So mm -hmm. that is, it's not, um, you know, whatever. And also, Kafka's Hebrew was also very good. And um, whether I said he we could, he, he could yeah. Do we know that. Yeah, his yeah, because Hebrew he, was very. Yeah, because he read he read about. Well, we have the notebooks, but he also read about 80 pages of Brenner. Is, if you try to read, Brenner is a difficult uh, Hebrew novelist, yeah. and and he was able to uh, read that much. One, you know, many there are Hebrew scholars. I mean, this did come out. Dan Marone, you mentioned Robert Alter. Dan Marone is really kind of the, I would say, after Gershon Shaked died, maybe the dean. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. The dean of of Hebrew literature. And he spent quite a bit of time now at Columbia and Stanford uh, after he retired from the Hebrew University. He also said, 
not just Judith Butler, that Kafka's works don't belong in Jerusalem because he was not a Zionist. And worse, he did not join the Hebrew Renaissance movement. He did not become a Hebrew writer. I think Miron is wrong. I don't think Miron got this one right, and we've discussed it, and I've said that to him, with all due respect to him, because he certainly is a, a great scholar. But I think he, misunderst he misunderstood the extent to which uh, someone like Kafka applied himself to he his Hebrew studies. He spoke Hebrew with Dora. He spoke Hebrew with, with uh, Tova, with, um, Pua ben Tovim. That is, he wrote, he wrote to her in Hebrew. And this is, I mean, this is not something you say, well, okay, we just take that for granted. This is, some, this is a major act. Mm -hmm. It's a major statement. Uh, I agree. I mean, I studied Hebrew uh, for, <laughs> I have notebooks in Hebrew. I don't think anybody's <laughs> going to think that, uh, you know, my belongings should go to, to the Israel National Library. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, there's uh, there's uh, I don't know. There, I find it uh, strange that um, I get, and this is coming back to Judith Butler's argument: um, the idea that somebody would claim somebody who, uh, an author who died in 1924, uh, who had never been to Palestine, uh, uh, for as part of the national patrimony a little bit strange. I mean, uh, I mean, if Jackson Pollock has, has, had given a painting to somebody who's living in Israel, would, would is, is the national, uh, is the, uh, the museum in a position to say that this is Jewish property? I mean, there's something a little bit uh, suspicious about suddenly uh, claiming I mean, there are physical, there are specific ramifications also for this. With this court decision, um, these documents have been taken out of, have been uh, deemed not to belong to this woman. It means that she won't get any money for it. She's not in a position to sell it either to the National Library in Israel or to another institution, to Columbia University or to the National Archive in Marbach. They've simply taken it. Um, and sh they don't have to pay anything for it. But actually, before um, the ruling came down, the judge said that any monies that were derived from this material would go to the. That's the right, but uh, but uh, and and the judge also released the funds that were in the right. Hoffa estate to the daughters. That is clear. So proceeds from the sale of the trial. But in this case, uh, Marbach would pay money in order to bring the manuscripts to, uh, they would have to get donors, they would have to raise money to do this. In this case, uh, it's simply going to go to the National Library at no charge. So, um, and that means that this woman who Max Brod very clearly intended to benefit financially from uh, the gift of these manuscripts has been stripped of the, those rights. <clears throat> there were several questions. Um, yes. We'll. You, you mentioned um, that the judge in the trial used uh, words from the trial at the trial. Would you <laughs> recollect what they might be? And secondly, how many manuscripts are there, or, or has it been uh, clearly stated, and, and are they short stories, or are they? Well, first of all, Almost nothing, it is almost certain that there's nothing of importance by Kafka that has not already been published. There are no hidden, you know, unknown novels or uh, stories by Kafka. Uh, it, it, Max Brod published everything he could that he felt was important. What is not known, and as Mark Gelber pointed out, or, um, Brod had, has notes about his early friendship with Kafka. Um, he has his diaries from 1902, 1904, 1906. Those documents have never been published, and their scholars, uh, Shelley Frisch is translating this uh, magisterial biography by Reiner Stach, a three-volume biography of Kafka. Um, Stach has held off writing the child, the, the early years of Kafka, 
in order in the hope that he would have access to this material. And he's been working on this for 20 years and waiting for the Hoffa family to give him access. He's never gotten access, and he's now having to write the third volume without it. So um, it's not really about the Kafka manuscripts. It's more about the Brot papers. Uh, there are probably a few drawings by Kafka, but the point is we don't know because it's locked up in a Tel Aviv apartment in a safe, and uh, uh, nobody really knows exactly what is there. <clears throat> yes. And how do you yeah. use the, the words of the trial in the trial? Uh, I have the court decision. I can find it after the event. If you want, I'll show it to you. Yes, please. Yeah, two quick things. First of all, um, I'm not sure. I'm going to suggest that it's very Kafkaesque, this whole thing. Uh, and, and to wonder whether in, there was some intentionality by either Kafka or Bro, um, seeing as Kafka burned some of the material but gave some of it, you know, I mean, that, that it's, it's kind of fishy. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the other point I want to make, uh, insofar as Germany housing the manuscripts, as much as it's unsavory, um, the Museum of American Ameri of the American Indian is right here in New York City, and not on the land of the limited land that we call reservations that we benevolently gave to the American Indian. Mm -hmm. Good point. So. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to? I'd like to uh, commend the three of you for providing this wonderful panel. My question is, you mentioned that Max Brod called Kafka the most Jewish writer. I wondered if you could elaborate on the criteria he used. Yeah. I, I don't know if I did say that. No, I thought I Mark, Mark, I thought Mark did, said yeah. it. I mean, I can't Mark elaborate quoted. on it, but would you like to elaborate on? I don't know what he meant exactly. Um, he just stated it in, in a review. Uh, he, Kafka, Max Brod from early on was kind of publicizing Kafka, even before Kafka had published anything. Max Brod was writing about him. He was a f more famous figure during, at that time. Um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, for instance, at the time that he wrote that uh, review, the trial and the castle had not been written yet. Uh, so the things that pop to mind, perhaps, of somebody who's stateless, who's wandering, uh, w doesn't belong anywhere, that uh, unjustly accused, arrested for never told what he's done wrong, none of that really existed. Uh, he was relying on early pieces, the judgment and the metamorphosis. Maybe that he read the metamorphosis in a Jewish uh, light, that is, uh, and Certainly the struggle with the father um, in the judgment, I think he would have seen as part of that generation of uh, Jewish sons fighting against their fathers, um, breaking away from the commercial origins to become artists, to become writers. Um, but I'm not sure what exactly, he, he didn't spell it out. In, um, I, you know, there, there seems to be, however, a certain kind of consensus uh, of late that Kafka's, Kafka and his work, um, they uh, convey the essence of being Jewish. That is, so there's a, a certain consensus out there about that. And the question is, well, what, is what does it mean? And um, Marone, Marone uh, in his most recent book, and a big part of it is devoted to Kafka, talks about his Jewish self-consciousness emanating from his work. Now, when, you, when his Jewish self-consciousness emanates from his writing, it means that we should easily be able to provide a, a variegated spectrum of Jewish readings of his work, and we can do that. So that even in, from his earliest work, that is, so when Max Brode wrote that, one can do such a thing. So one looks at a work like Das Urteil, The Judgment. Right? But there's, there, there, there are almost no, I can only think of one, 
specific reference in any of Kafka's fiction that is a Jewish, re is a, is a mm, explicit Jewish reference. But let's say in Das Urteil or in, the Metam in um, Die Verwandlung, in the Metamorphosis, which are, those are quite well-known stories, or in um, Fordham Gazettes, which is very, uh, before the law, which is part of the trial, for example, there are, one could say in, his, in, in the novel that was called America in its English, its first English translation, now called, I think, The Missing Person. The Man Who Disappeared. The Man Who Disappeared. It's been translated a couple of times. That is, so one can find so many, I would say countless, implicit Jewish references. Countless. One needs a guide for that because Kafka did not make it explicit. Mm -hmm. Kafka did not make it explicit. Mm -hmm. But Mark we can also find many, many Christian Absolutely. references. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you can the find many Gregor Christian Zam, references. Gregor Zamsa, so the Zamsa family is Christian. Uh, it's, it's made explicit in the story. Yeah. The mother makes the sign of the cross. There are several references yes. to Catholicism. That's right. So, what, so there, the Christian references are explicit. And in the trial as well, right? So you have many Christians. So, so the, the it's there. That's almost. It's not. The, I wouldn't say fishy. That's the term that you used before. It's something fishy. That is. But that. That is. But when one looks at the work, something is going on there. And what that is, for example. So, um, Gregor Samsa in the Metamorphosis, he, you know, his sister is trying to find some kind of food that is, that is palatable. That, that he's willing to eat because once he's been transformed into the bug, you know, he doesn't like any more the food, you know, so she tries, you know, rotting vegetables and, you know, sour milk and things like this to find something that he would eat. And she also serves, tries some rosinen und mando. So that's a Jewish reference. That is, if, you ser if you're serving up uh, raisins and almonds to your, to their, it's a, well, you know, maybe uh, our students don't pick that up as a Jewish reference because they don't know the Yiddish theater and they don't know uh, that is Yiddish music, which has made that into you know one of the great Yiddish tunes of you know the 20th century. They might not pick up on that kind of a reference, but it's a Jewish reference for for those who can read it as such. And mm -hmm. what I said about so David Suchoff, who wrote this work about Jewish languages in Kafka, and they're in, the, in the, um, the castle. He talks about how he sees it as a meditation about Hebrew. Well, and you have to be a very sophisticated reader in order to pick that up. You need a guide. You need a guide. Mm -hmm. um, I, first of all, thank you very much for extremely interesting conversation. I don't personally don't have a problem with uh, Kafka documents being dispersed through the world and something being in United States, something being anywhere and some in Israel. But I really have another problem. I am from former Soviet Union, from Russia. And there are, I know personally a lot of Russian writers and uh, poets who are actually Jewish, consider themselves Jewish, went to Israel, uh, learn Hebrew and learn Hebrew literature, but still, still writing in Russian, and their literature would not even mean anything in Jewish context. So, for example, many their relatives uh, suffered from, from Stalinism. Many were killed, many were in Gulag. Uh, for example, Mandelstam were killed in Gulag, Pasternak, and all that. So, should we take, for example, Pasternak and uh, Mandelstam poetry and give it to Jewish state because they are Jewish and they consider themselves Jewish and they suffer because they are Jewish? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can answer that one if you want. Yes, the, Mark, please. Again, what, what, um, this, the state of Israel as a, realiza a political realization of one variety of Zionism that is, um, claims to represent the Jewish people inter throughout the world. Now, Judith Butler was very upset about this and said, 
you know, that she doesn't say that. She just says that the state of Israel does not represent world Jewry. Right? That's what she said. But the state of Israel doesn't see it that way. The state of Israel says if Jews in the Soviet Union or in Ethiopia or in the United States or in France or anywhere else are in danger, then it sees it as its responsibility to try to rescue that Jewry, save that Jewry, aid that Jewry, support that Jewry throughout the world. There are many, many programs like that. And one that is where emissaries from the state of Israel try to support Jewish communities throughout the world, for example. And in the same sense, many Jews in the Soviet Union, in South America, in the United States, who feel a connection, who feel that sense of belonging to the nation, so, more than they might feel the connection to their home country, that is their, their place of residence, their abode, where they live, their residence, they do send their material voluntarily to the Jewish National Library. They do. So if pastor, it doesn't matter from what country they do this. I mean, it's, it's, now the question here, if I understood Mark Anderson correctly, is the question of appropriation. And what's at stake, as, as Vivian Liska put it, goes, what's at stake here? Now, um, I, ha that is the, I think that the Jewish National Library understands its mandate, and it, as it did from the, from the time when there were national institutions that, in, um, that were being developed. The Jewish nation didn't have a state or didn't have a recognized homeland. They were, uh, it was a, this was a, dia a people in the diaspora as they are today, but with a recognizable state of, that is well, so the homeland for many who see it that way. One does not have to, one can certainly, and this was in the theory of Zionism from the, certainly from Herzl if not before. Herzl did not think that all Jews in the world would ever come to live in the state of Israel. And he said that was fine. He even thought that would be wonderful, it would give the state, the existence of the state would make it possible for Jews in the diaspora to assimilate. And if they wanted to, that was fine. There's no problem mm -hmm. with that as far as he was concerned. But he said for those who wanted to live a national existence as a Jewish person in a Jewish state, this was one particular option for them. So when that Jewish National Library came into existence, the first time that it's mentioned, as, as, as well as I know, is in 1875, a particular Jew from Bialystok, uh, Yosef Chazanovitz started a collection. He said, you know, Jews writing in any language, Russian, German, French, Italian, English, in their work, they incorporate the Jewish spirit. So he started collecting works written by Jews, hoping eventually to find an appropriate repository for them, which eventually became the Jewish National Library. Under the but, auspices but of Mark, I, I mean, I, the point is well taken, and uh, uh, that Israel sees its uh, its raison d'etre as uh, offering a homeland to all Jews is is clear and important in the history of Zionism and history of Israel. But it's another thing to put the force the the of the law uh, behind appropriation um, and say not. Eva Hoffa did not voluntarily give the manuscripts to Israel. She wanted to do something else with them, and now the state, with all of its uh, authority, is saying, you can't do that, we are going to take it. Um, so, I mean, what kind of legal precedent does this set? I mean, if Philip Roth letters are in a Tel Aviv apartment of a friend of his, can uh, the National Library say on the basis of this decision, um, this is patrimony for the Jewish people, um, whoever received these letters doesn't really own them? Well, listen, first of all, you have to realize, of course, the case is much more complicated. We have here a Tel Aviv family court. Yeah. We do not have the state of Israel appropriating anything. There's a legal case we're talking about inheritance law, uh, the particular interpretation of a will that was read by a judge. You, you may be right to say 
there was some kind of political expressions because the state attorney of Israel, he expressed his opinion in public. But of course, many Israelis, as in any country, expressed pros and cons about the decision and the judge made her decision, I think, I said courageously, but certainly independently. I don't think it was the state, the, the state, and we're not talking about the state you know, police or something coming into an apartment and, and taking the material. We're talking about, and as you said before, the material has not yet been even delivered. I mean, the, because we have due process of law and there's an appeal process going on right now. So that is in a particular family court it was, we call it Tel Aviv, but it's really Ramad Gan. The judge made this particular kind of a decision. It's a it's legal process. Mm -hmm. I think there, um, there was some questions. We can take either a final question or collect some questions for a last statement. I yes. I saw Terry wanted to. Uh, Terry, I should. Check. OK. Terry. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to thank all the panelists for a wonderful and illuminating discussion. I suspect the uh, ghost of Franz Kafka is having a nice chuckle over this whole uh, <laughs> uh, affair. Um, my, my one uh, uh, writing of Kafka that I was expecting to come up that didn't come up was his, his list of things he failed at, on which he included both Zionism and anti-Zionism, uh, <laughs> which is funny because six, you, you would think failure in one implies success in the other, and vice versa, yet he believed he had managed to fail at both of them. Um, and also, just as a, uh, on the question of what is the significance of manuscripts, uh, Mark with the, with the Kippa will, will know the source of this, I don't, but there's a, there's a story we read, I think on, on Yom Kippur, of one of the martyrs, who, one of the rabbis of antiquity who was being uh, killed by the Romans wrapped in the scrolls of the Torah. And his, as he was dying, his student said to him, uh, Rabbi, what do you see? And he said, the parchment is burning, but the letters are flying free. Uh, I thought that was particularly uh, be appropriate, since the, the, what, the parchment's going to go here or it's going to go there, but Kafka's writing is mm. eternal and for all humanity. Very good. Uh, I think that's a wonderful Very ending. Good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Good Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>